appear that old because my mom went into labor like a good Catholic woman six weeks early when Kennedy was shot. So, now that's neither here nor there, but what is here nor there is that I know the dangers of, of doing anything around Halloween. I mean, Thanksgiving. <laughs> Sorry, did I? I guess I slipped uh, about my family. But, you know, the thing about Thanksgiving is that, like, I will have a birthday party and everyone will say, I would love to come, but I have to have family with my ex-husband and 14 grandchildren. And I'm like, I'm like, bless your heart, we will get together another time. But that is true of all pre-Thanksgiving things, with the possible exception of football. <laughs> football, people will go to no matter what it is. In fact, football, Thanksgiving, I think, has a, a friendship, a relationship. So that being the case, Welcome to a Movable Bees November edition. Um, we just published our first chapbook that was Ash Hook's um, Surviving the Post-Mormon Apocalypse. Um, you've heard us read here and around town, and we decided that we should really get it down on paper. And also, we have a chapbook press, just, just to let you know. Um, and so that's available on the table. It's 10 bucks if you'd like it. We're taking December off because if you think this th bad thing happens in November, the thing that happens in December is worse. And also sometimes I need to lie down for all of December. Um, and I just want to point out the sign up for the mailing list is over there. Um, if you're not on our list, and I think everyone here is. Um, and we really want to thank uh, Johnny and thank Kay. And thank Kay who is not doing well, so she's not here, but just the whole Spark Project Collective has been extremely generous to us, allowing us to function, allowing us to use any money we do get to be able to um, make chat books, make a book series. So, um, per playing money. So, there are some opportunities coming up. Um, one is for Writing in Place at Sabino Canyon. Writing in Place at Sabino Canyon is headed up by Lisa Martin, and what she does is she a bunch? She sends out an email saying, "I'm we're having a writing in place." People go to Sabino Canyon. You walk for a little bit. You write for a little bit. You walk for a little bit. Um, and I've never been because I can't walk. <laughs> I can't walk like that. But it's very. It's really beautiful. And someday I'm hoping we can figure out a way to adapt <coughs> it, or she can. If you're interested in that, let me know. I'll forward you to Lisa. Uh, we'd like to remind you about Revolutionary Grounds, um, our sister um, open mic, which is at, Re which is the Re at the Revolutionary Grounds first Friday of every month. Um, there's also a Poetry in Tucson Facebook group, so if we are not to your taste, something else can totally happen. Um, if so, if, so if anything makes you uncomfortable, you really should tell me. Um, if anyone makes you uncomfortable, you really should tell me so I can beat them up. <laughs> if I make you uncomfortable, you should tell me so I can beat myself up. I just want to make that absolutely clear. Um, so this is a safe space in the broadest sense you can imagine. Um, we usually ask people to grab some food or something to drink, and we'll start in a few minutes. But I think we're going to start. And I'm going to get a chair because I'm going to start. <laughs> You're stuck with me. So I'm a pretty good poet, but lately, I, for like the last 10 years since I got sick, I found writing pretty impossible. So now I've just started thinking about how can I do something that isn't as hard as poetry, which is the hardest thing. And one of the things I just thought I would do is called talking, um, where I talk to you about the things that I've been thinking about, and then you listen. So yep. here's a couple of the things. I'm turning 60 on November 24th. Um, and my friend asked me, is that a door? Are you going through a door? And I'm like, no. Let me tell you about Lost Wave. Lost Wave is well, it's a hashtag, of course, and it's a Reddit group, which is important to me because the sort of geeky single-mindedness of Reddit just, I love that. I just 
want to lean deep into that, I'm totally willing to spend like 27 hours looking at a copy of the spectrograph of the isolated vocals. Sure. Reddit has a lot of problems, but people who aren't engaged isn't one. So, so somehow I read something on the internet, and then the next thing I know, I'm at a Lost Wave website. And this is what Lost Wave is. Lost Wave is music that somebody has that nobody knows where it came from. Now, a lot of these pieces, these Lost Wave pieces, are they're pretty special. Um, and actually, I'm going to use my phone to play one for you if I can remember where my phone is. Um, Nonetheless, so, so the, one that, the one that is called the most mysterious song on the internet is called, is something that is either blind the wind, hide the wind, or like the wind. And, it is, and when people listen to it, it sounds like English, but maybe it's German, but maybe it's Greek. And it's been being looked for since the late 90s. A guy in Germany, a kid, because when you were, because young people, they do this thing where they, well, they don't do this anymore, but old people who were young people do this thing where they record things off radios. Um, and they record, you know, so, so you like recorded and you essentially have this artifact that has nothing. And then, like, and then you go to Usenet in 1998 and say, has anyone ever heard of this song? Nobody's heard of it. Then 10 years later, you're like on Google groups going, has anyone heard of this song? Nobody's heard of it. Then in 2019, you put it on YouTube, gets picked up by a Reddit group. Still, we know nothing about it, but we know it exists. The door that I went through is that the difference between me and somebody 30 years younger than I am is that I essentially know that almost all art is lost forever. They're astounded. They're astounded that they cannot find it. But for every bit of fame, I think there are 100 people who are doing that fine of work that no one no one will remember their name. No one will know who it is. I mean, during the sort of quasi-socialist 1950s and 60s, we had people like Pete Seeger going and like collecting all the songs from Appalachia, and then we had folkways, and then we had the Smithsonian, et cetera. But we don't have that now. The thing that exists is what exists digitally. And for the kids have read it, they're stunned that these songs have been lost. And I'm just like, yes, it's fascinating that we have them, they've been lost. But almost all art is lost. The art I'm doing now will likely be lost. And that's, that's a really interesting thing. That's my door. My door is more knowing that the work I've made and that the work most artists made will be lost versus turning 60. And the other door was when I got sick. So she's like, it's a door. And I'm just like, you know, when I was younger and a, like, you know, a dumb hippie punk, I had a lot of friends who died of heroin. Like for a moment, there was a moment where I was like 26 where it's like all my friends are dead or in jail. And now, you know, and I got, sick about, I got sick about 13 years ago with rheumatoid arthritis, which is a very annoying disease, which is supposed to be shortening my life every minute. So every time now, now I'm having another cluster of people dying. And I'm just like, and I, I should be like too young, but I'm mostly like, holy fuck, it wasn't me. Holy fuck, it wasn't me. Because like, I just assume, and my friend says too soon, and I'm like, no, holy fuck wasn't me. And uh, that is a really different thing in terms of getting older, walking through that door. Um, I can't imagine 60 as a door. I can't imagine temporality as a door. I think doors are event-based or intellectually based, 
versus temporally based. So, I hope you guys find your doors. And I'm going to get the list because, of course, I didn't get it first. Then Gabriel. So, our first poet is Steve. I think I can speak loud enough so everybody can, can hear. Forward for my sad camera. Uh, Speaking slowly for the sad camera. Okay. Oh, is this in the way? I'm here today because uh, I'm uh, unfortunately I'm celebrating my grandson's. Uh, I buried him on uh, November 20th, uh, three years ago. And so uh, I'm dedicating, uh, I, and I started writing at that time. I've never written before. I got 12 books like this now. Uh, but this is my angel book. And it's uh, Angel, his name was Taylor, and I call this Angel Tay. A special angel in heaven so high sits in the rainbow and awaits to fly. Brother Hawk flies to show the way, keeps protective eyes on a young man called Tay. Very hard he played a strong young soul. What fate had laid was a mournful stroll. On earth he'd roll, then his tune would fade. Faded life the toll, Lord's plan was made. It had to be a line stars tell all, where all could see was Bella the ball, would answer the call a true friend indeed, catching those who'd fall or help those in need. His stories we read gives no reply, never planted a seed, too soon he died. Was too low to fly, we all agree, but question why, a heavenly plea. Was heaven's plan needs a healthy soul, where angels expand to meet Lord's goal? Earthly body cold, now we'll understand. So he left his fold and formed a new band. Looks over this land with dreams so bold, guidance and demand, now breaking the mold. Where memories are told and stories fly free, past dreams gone cold, clear for all to see. From day to day he needed to show, so he played his way, helping all to grow. Either high or low, shine eternal ray, to let all know a new angel named Tay. Um, and this is how he became an angel. And I call this 11 11. That was the time on the clock. A date hastily made with a turn of fate. Dreams began to fade as he as he gets it too late. Life he tried to share hard, he did try. Life too short to spare never would comply. Cloudy in his mind, fooled by deception. Crossed his own line, lost all perception. A choice much too late, booze and youth combined. Asked to make this date wish, he had declined. Time to hold on tight, driving well beyond. A dark starry night, rode his road he seldom on. Shaky trembling hand, why he lost control. Driving over sand, stumble, tumble roll. Rugged cliff so steep, sharp curve in the bend. Bumper dug in deep, car flipped and the end. Blunt force to the head, this, there is no cure. Instant he was dead. Jackstead was unsecured. Seat belt torn and frayed, ejected from his car. Saw spot where he laid, he never reached the bar. Quickest way to heaven, there, where this tale ends. Eleven past eleven seen through the blurry lens. Final call was made at 222. Body softly laid through the air he flew. Never felt the pain, making all feel sick. Sorry and so wrong, wish one, wish for one last kiss. See his spirit strong, knew this love would miss. Pluto was a sign, star he worshiped most. Crossed a broken line, followed it so close. Clearly we all learned how he handled strife. Heaven he has earned by grace of his life. Um, I'm sorry, I really messed that up. But. Oh, okay. oh, thank you. Um, thank you, gentlemen, step from here. This is a, a hawk in disguise, and that's who he is. 
Sad and so tragic, all should not have been. Gone is the magic, life and death will blend. Now he tells the tales of so long ago, before any fails, happy faces show. From the days born, looking toward the stars, took life by the horn, Pluto, never Mars, caught bugs in a jar, played with fireflies. Not so bizarre, saw the wonder in his eyes. Traveled and explored, finding panaceas, all hard when he roared, all heard when he roared, grandest of ideas. Deep was his roots, knowledge no surprise, hiking were his boots, laughs were his cries. Always was in search, real true adventure, desert was his church, danger was his venture. Led his friends on hikes, always with a plan, all the fun one likes, games he would command. Times they all gathered, food, drink, and party. How it all mattered, safe, and was so hardy. Play and pop some corn, games of strategy. Friendships now are sworn through the galaxy. Beyond tragedy, timely time to play. Thoughts of long goodbyes, story of, I'm sorry, through the travesty, playing all the way. Thoughts of long goodbyes, story of one boy, with one last surprise, ending all this joy. White wolf went alive. Now hawk in disguise, so we can derive, angel we realize. After life the prize, day he won't survive. On this day he dies, heaven he will arrive. And he, and he sends me signs all the time. I see him everywhere. The numbers, 1111 was, his phone died at 1111. That's his time of death. We got called at 222 in the morning. I don't make this up, that's the way it happened. But now he sends signs. He will soon be able, with spirits who want to show, how to become an angel, must wait for wings to grow. Sending signs from high above, understood by loved ones all. Sweetest time to feel such love, catching souls who stumble and fall. Need to learn the rules of heaven, with spirits who laugh and play, so they teach 24-7. Just listen to what they have to say. Learning ways to send all a message, message with an inspiring call. Calm the sorrow to fix the damage, catching souls who stumble and fall. Give relief to family below, real signs of hope in the sky. Hawks in flight as some fly low, image form this message high. Visions in view now will show from picture minds, from picture clouds long and tall. Friends and family will finally know he's catching souls who stumble and fall. Signs you sent were very clever. As an angel, you're safe forever, understood by loved ones all. Now catching souls who stumble and fall. Thank you. And I'm gonna end it with a heaven, heaven's design. When angels come, give reason why, though hearts are numb, still need to try. The help they give is just for you, gives ease to live like one should do. New angels part to sprout some wings, but Pluto's chart, new angel sings, new breaks and breaks the mold when all in line, either young or old, it's heaven's design. Lord, he knew right from the start, showed it too, so pure of heart, gives an angel to guide our life. So minds untangle, now blind of strife, no chance of violence or silly fits, in quiet silence the angel sits, and now are told how all was fine, either young or old, it's heaven's design. When spirits rise, all time will tell. All in disguise rings silver bell. Shows open arms to hug you tight. Full of charms so strong of might. Felt by all through the seasons was final call, soulful reasons. How life turns cold in sudden decline. Well, either young or old is heaven's design. Kneel in prayer, hang up your sword. So deep we care, so deep we care, pray with the Lord. And leave the fold when life's aligned. Either young or old, uh, it's heaven's design. And, and I really meant to end it there, but you know, I, I, I want to finish holy wine. And this is, um, this is what I believe here. A grand life ahead thought we all would see, a mind clear and bright, smart as one could be. Unfair it may seem, cries sound so loud. Why one so innocent? Why one so proud? Was this a, a last choice or a random pick? Strong and so healthy, he never was sick. Life torn, life torn and shattered, unexpected death. Gives no reason why he took one last breath. Spirits hold on tight with a golden rod. Open pearly gates to the house of God. His soul clean and pure. Reward he will see. Promise Lord and made. Shows how life will be.
Held in great regard, morals clearly shine. Now only few receive this bread and holy wine. I'm just a 70 year old baby here. We are all babies. Here's 45 seconds of a lost <laughs> wave. He's ready, but I And that is all we have of this. That's the unknown song? That is a unknown, song. unknown song. This one is called either Dance for Hours a Day or Dance Floor Was His Name. We are not <laughs> sure. If you want to Google either of those, you will get the same 31 minute, 31 second thing. Now this is possibly, so I'm, I'll probably play you another two songs because now I know how to do it. But mm. this is possibly my favorite one because it doesn't sound like anything I've ever heard. It sounds kind of like, like some sort of manic Mary Poppins musical about mm. like running away from boys because they think that their name is, is dance floor and all of their names are dance with them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you you know, because it's all about. I mean, literally, she says we believe. She says, you know. If you were a pill, I would take up drinking. Um, so, so that is a really good example of a uh, lost wave. What re read it is researching it while we speak. So our next reader is going to be uh, Joanna. Anyway, um, this was my second collection, DNA Like Jam. came out the, this past summer. I only have the one copy of it with me now, but if anyone's like, interested. Oh. It's $25. I mean, I have more at like L. Do you have Venmo or Zelle? I, I do have Venmo. Okay. Theoretically. I don't, <laughs> I'm not sure that I remember my Venmo name and I don't want to give you the wrong name and like have you pay someone else. I understand. <laughs> I understand. We will figure it out. I don't have $25 on me, but I want that book. Okay, thank you. Um, anyway. Um, uh, tonight my poems are political because, uh, that was what came upon me this morning. Okay, uh, get a part-time job, drive a ride ship, open an Etsy store, deliver groceries, teach yourself how to day trade, invent a side hustle, see all the options we have. We get to choose our own adventures our own personal methods of laboring ourselves into dust. This is freedom, we convince ourselves, because our primary professions won't provide us the means to live. So we have this distinct privilege of selecting the type of nails used in our capitalist crucifixion. Our billionaire oligarchs proselytize without pause. That our lives only have meaning when we work so hard and so much that we have no time or energy left to think about what we are doing and why. But maybe it's better that way. Because if we did ever figure out that we have only avoided being crushed beneath the boot of finance because we are wedged in the grooves of the soul, then we might be depressed that this unceasing grind is neither noble nor divinely ordained. Yet still, we join the billionaires in preaching the gospel of the hustle. Because to get by, we must work ourselves to exhaustion. And it is slightly easier to bear it if you surrender to true belief. Sadly, that unshakable faith will not change the fact that nothing we do or complete or achieve will ever be enough. Because in capitalism, there must always be more. The economic system relies on endless expansion. So if you've not 
figure out how to manipulate the time-space continuum <laughs> to always devote more time and more energy, then you are lost. And you have lost. We commodify ourselves. Our bodies, our time, our lives are only valuable to the extent they generate more revenue. And we have to stop these calculations because the money that we earn does not determine our value as human beings. We make a wage. We are not made by a wage. Twenty twenty was a great year for me. Twenty twenty one even better in twenty twenty two. Oh orgasmic. <laughs> See, I've been unemployed for like half a century, relegated to lazing about, chilling with the skirts and blouses. Uh, the worst was the early two thousands, all the <laughs> hip buggers and halter tops. Terrible gossips just shared way too much of your business. But now, my industry is on the midst, it's in the midst of a resurgence. See, back in the 70s, people thought what I was doing was just too dangerous, just twisted. And the women's liberation movement managed to convince the Supreme Court to agree. So my job, was sanitized. I was replaced by forceps and a speculum, by mifepristone and misoprostol. But in the 2020s, abortions are getting pushed back out of doctor's offices, and the people doing the pushing say they don't want to put anyone in danger. They just want to end all abortions. But they know that's a lie. They know that the only logical of outcome of overturning Roe v. Wade is me. Because Joan Crawford may have said, no more white hangers ever. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because I am back. When women are trapped, no matter if their prison is economic, medical, familial, emotional, they will contort me every which way to try and pick the lock to their cage. And they're desperate enough to do it, knowing that I may kill them. <laughs> These people who are so upset about the cons contents of other people's uteruses enrage me because they are potent on my turf. <laughs> I am the one who is supposed to get bent out of shape over other people's abortions. <laughs> but it is hard for me to be too upset with them when they are throwing me more work. Because when women can no longer control their own bodies, they will turn to the one thing they can control. Me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The next um, lost wave, David is going to read, but soon, first I'm going to make you listen to another lost wave. I'm going to tell the story about the lost wave. So this particular lost wave, hmm, things are terrifying. I'll hold. I'll talk and then I will put it in. This particular lost wave was, um, was, is a song called How Long Will It Take? The only place we have been able to find this song, the only place this song came from, and the place that this song can only be tra tra tracked back to is Russian bootleg DVDs. So you know when you get a bootleg DVD and it will have like seven movies on it, etc. And Russia has is really big on the bootleg. So this song is a song they've been using for the menu of the Russian bootleg DVDs. So she'll have this, and then there'll be 
for example, you'll see like Shrek and like a couple of other uh, animations and this one. Okay. I think it sounds like the Cranberries, but the Cranberries have denied knowledge of the song and refused to acknowledge it in any way. So it's not the Cranberries. It definitely has this early 90s, early 2000s, six pence. And so this is the song, but the only place we find it is on the background of these Russian DVDs. So you'll have like Shrek here, and you know, I want to say Animaniacs, but that's not what I'm talking about, but like Wally, -E. you can tell how unpixelated I am, Fighting Nemo, you know, but and then in the background, this will be playing over and over again. And no one knows where it actually came from. But what we do know is David's going to play read for us next. So, um, I wasn't planning on reading. Um, so I'm glad to be here, though. Um, yeah, this is definitely November. And also, last time, April, is St. Patrick's Day in April? March. We, March, okay. We landed on St. Patrick's Day last year. And uh, yeah, like 12, actually less people showed up than, yeah, than are even here tonight. When, when I lived in Portland and was doing spare room, we regular, regularly, accidentally, scheduled things like Easter and the Super Bowl. <laughs> People, you know, and then like maybe three people there, and, and and somebody was like, "Oh, it's a Super Bowl," and I'm like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> and so is the rest of the collective. You saw that. What? I watch the Puppy Bowl, um, and my sister's dog will watch the Puppy Bowl, and that is, uh, I like watching her watch the Puppy Bowl. Um, so I've been on sort of a weird kick lately with different things. Um, but I've been reading a lot of, uh, I don't know how many of you know who Emmanuel Levinas is. He's a, a phenomenologist, um, he, which is basically just a study of how things come into your mind and then what they do there. And I started reading Emmanuel Levinas when <clears throat> the attack had happened in Israel um, because um, my family is both some weird mixture of various fundamentalist Christianities and um, Jewish. Uh, and so um, we had family in Dachau. And so you watch this, and I know this is sort of like uh, going to get me in trouble, but we're not Zionists. You know, we, we are the people who uh, we never were. Um, sort of the Anselm Hollow quote. Uh, Diaspora is the ideal state is kind of the mantra I have, and uh, so you know I'm watching, and it's just it. If you've been watching it for a while, which we had, my sister and I, um, and dad and mom, uh, this was nothing new. It was going to happen. Um, we were just sort of could have we didn't think it would happen this way, but it was going to happen. Um, because it's an open air prison, the Gaza Strip, and Hamas is basically a resistance movement gone horribly, horribly wrong. Um, and so, and then you have Benny or Bibi, who, um, whenever I see Bibi on television, I go, I am Batman, um, because that's just who he is, is he's just, I will protect you and I will beat the shit out of everyone else to do it. Um, and he's, a, he's, he's just corrupt as hell. And so I wrote, I was in the middle of writing this uh, thing, which is this uh, steady of attention through poetry called Ebbles, which was trying to fix um, the problems with my first book, uh, which uh, I wrote over a year and a half, and it resolves itself way too much at the end. And I have sort of come to 
loathe the ending. And if I could, I'd cut it out. Um, <laughs> but I, it's there. It's published. It's what it is. So, um, but I'm just going to read uh, this. And, and, and I was uh, doing this close attention thing and trying to date in these days, which is like, oh, fuck me. Uh, the online dating is a horror. Uh, I, I just, I have no idea what that is. So I've, I've, you know, so anyway, I've read parts of this before. I'm just going to, since we have time. There's a romance novel called Book Lovers in this cafe and bookstore. The lovers are set back to back, seemingly unaware of each other, as if at any moment they'll discover their counterpart. The man is slouching, almost lounging, while the woman sits up straight with her back nearly 90 degrees to her legs. The books they're, small, the books they're reading are small, white, and identical. Twined snare, looped and unbound, looped around fingers and mind's toes, around tunneled sinew and freckled musings, jumping to conclusions that could never be, which is to say I'm sorry, sorry for what happened, and even more for what I couldn't open to. When asked which jelly belly I'd like, I responded, I wish there was a way to know. <laughs> I had a long conversation with a friend about what love is. The conversation was fine, but illusory, never moving beyond our own insecurities and failures to love. Afterwards, I realized we spoke poorly of love, as if love were mere passion rather than as love having the capacity to stoke passion. Love was always an opening, a merging of subjectivities allowing spirit to cleave to spirit unalone. It's dangerous and often irrational. It's also one of the greatest things we do. In Exodus, after seven plagues, the Bible said, says, God hardens Pharaoh's heart, whereas for the previous seven, it reads, Pharaoh's heart was hard. So for locust darkness and the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh has no choice but be made example of. God's hilarious. One cannot control psychosis, only foster joy and deride the dream. Chipo McChug's singles group of the glorious revolution, who put the oh my in BMI. Tucson's dust gets everywhere, in my hair, between my toes, and occasionally in my eyes. It blows like an earthen haze, settling in layers. It greases my thoughts and weighs on my dreams. When damp, it becomes dark and hosts plants of limited kind. As a child, I saw a girl spin through the dust like a brass top. She spun as if there was nothing to do but spin. And for a moment, she was right. Her dust was lovely, and I envied them. I have this sort of revolving shtick with doorbell missionaries. Um, with another doorbell missionary. Are you all right? It's hot out. Would you like a drink? I'm Israel High. And I don't pronounce it from my throat enough at all. Um, the people of Israel live. Tikkun olam, the repair of the world. Talmud's command, do not become the darkness you fear. A defense of poems about flowers. The world is bowing, but burning, and I write about flowers, about memory and poppy fields, about gathering what is precious in a dying world. I see the murder and the repayment of murder with murder, and the histories of murder, and the grandiose apologies for murder. Still there is power in flowers, and their precious precarity and insistence to bloom. They are still here, and perhaps I can be also. Bruises wor breezes whirl and sway, limbs colors red, a yellow and orange ballet, measure ever-changing and bare, duck soup pearly and persuasive, cooler and crimson, a craven smudgy dance, mush, motion forever mangy and settled sun. Windy, mobile, and versatile, these colors are angry. A craven and bopping orange, constant through changing orbits. His personality was indulgence and resolve. The purple edge was cooler. Ambiguous dances imagined. He always wanted peace and a naked exit. Took a risk, looked the fool, wasn't their type. A spin down, a kick to self. Then I moved along. Sacrifice the impossible, the morning tune. A mind machine steps through its paces. Imago and vortex 
a cyclonal logic underneath the sleight of hand, something remains. Love may be a sacred wounding. Your pain confronted me, and together we cradled it. And together we cradled it. You withdrew, and I called. You refused to meet, and I wished for a new beginning. We sacrificed Verity at daybreak, lied to put pain from sight. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take half an album cut.
person will be Maurice, who is probably not going to use the sound Amplification. Phone. Okay. Yes. I feel compelled to have to respond to what you said, David. Mm -hmm. um, Netanyahu is not interested in a two-state solution, yeah. nor is Hamas. Get rid of them both. Yeah. <sighs> I'm going to do one song, maybe two. Um, the first one is um, a George Harrison song that he wrote for the Beatles. The Beatles did it. It's called Long, Long, Long. Oh, yeah. Did I hear a, a, a confirmation that you know that song? Because <laughs> it's, not, it's not one of their most recognizable songs. Long, 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 long yes. Time. But um, the story behind it is that initially it was thought that it was about just traditional relationship. Um, but, then he, but, but then he wrote about it later after the Beatles break up that it, uh, it was, well, we all know that George Harrison was um, spiritual and all that. And um, so it was, it was really written as a, about his devotion to a deity, many deities. <laughs> I'd like to go with the original thought about it, that it was about human relationships and lost and found. Yeah. <laughs> we'll go with that. And let's, let's, let's see if I can get this. I have to refer to my lyrics. I'm playing this with a pick, and I don't have my pick. I have my pick. No, no, I, I, I have it. I just didn't, I just, just didn't pull it out.
Another one? Yes. Of course. Okay. Um, <coughs> now these, uh, I, these are kind of works in progress. As Even if I've been working on them a long time, they're always works in progress, and I'm kind of new at public performing. Um, this one, um, a song by Tracy Chapman called uh, Baby Can I Hold, Baby Can I Hold You. And this one, oops, oh, okay. got two, two. Two pages, two pages. <clears throat> See how this goes. I don't purport to be a singer, <clears throat> barely a guitar player. So, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. I gotta remember this. Wow. I'm forgetting how the, uh, how I, this is the key to the rest of the song, how I started. She's, oh boy. I lost my keys. <laughs> I, can't, I can't open the door. As you, you know, <laughs> talking about doors opening. <laughs> oh my goodness. I gotta think of the song. Do you know the song? Sorry. Um, Sorry. So you do not say Yes, yes, yes. Words go by okay. and stay. Yeah, yeah. You can sing along. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't say appropriate. But you, but you gave me the key. Okay. I, now I know how to start it. Yay, nice. I think, oh my goodness. That's not it. So. Be mine. You'd be mine. 
I know, I know. You're on key, but a lot of that. <laughs> You're really on key there. Good, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for the Thanks. for the assistance. Sorry that I could not always remember which word we were on, but you, well, you do it pretty well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I don't know that. They, so I don't know that. They kind of repeat. Well. It says it's, it's not a hard. There aren't that many uh, individuals. Like, sorry, there. forgive me. I love you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one of one of the sort of amazing things that's yeah. happened. Yeah. You were. Yes. One of the sort of amazing things that's happened is that Tracy Chapman just won like a country music award yes. for Fast Car, yeah. yes. and it's like, yeah. you know, I, you know, I'm an old. I remember sitting in the grass listening to that song and just like being like, oh, okay, this is where we're going. Of course, it wasn't where we were going, <laughs> but the fact that people are still listening to it means maybe that this is where we're going. So our next person will be Gabriel Dozel, and I just want to say really quickly. What an admirer I am of his work. So I don't know where I heard it, but I was somewhere and it was red. Maybe it was in a movable beast. It could have been one of our movable beasts sure. downtown. And I was just like, whoa, I am blown away. And, you know, I actually kind of hate poetry. <laughs> <laughs> in every way, <laughs> especially mine. Um, but, you know, but I just. I mean, a lot of poetry is the same all the time, or it's trying to be this sort of artifact or polished thing. And what I think is so amazing about Gabriel's work is that it, it feels to me so fundamentally alive. Mm -hmm. And that is not how poetry usually goes. <laughs> you know this, Gabriel. You know this. I know this. You know this. And so. I'm so happy to have him come. I think we'll probably ask him to be a featured poet in a future time too, because he needs, we want all of his featuredness on everything. We want it spread on everything. So, Gabriel. And it's been a pleasure uh, getting to hear uh, Gerald's music, Gerald's poetry. I mean, it's, Movable Beast is always such a great surprise. Um, and I'm, and I was surprised again uh, you tonight. Movable Beast, you just never know. I know, I know. and it's got, it's got a rockin' name, too. Like, Movable Beast is a rockin' name. I mean. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so. I think we all Eric, named it together. Eric, good, good, yeah, yeah it was a group effort, a group effort, yeah. yeah. So, I so, and one thing I loved about getting, to, getting asked to do this again is it gives me an excuse to write some new work or come up. I knew, that like, okay, I've got to have something new for Movable Beast, right? So, um, yeah. Fail better for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Yeah. So talking about doors or forgetting your keys, forgetting your keys. Yeah, like on that, on that note there, um, I just happen to have this poem that is... Uh, a riff off of a Jerry Seinfeld stand-up stand -up bit, but I've just uh, kind of spliced, this is very experimental, uh, this is very uh, outside the box for me, but I took a Jerry Seinfeld bit and I just plugged in um, images and language about the border. And so, so I feel like this is just a great place to, to do that. Like, oh, yeah, start totally up. do that. Yeah, okay, here we go. I wonder, I wonder if there's keys to the border. Do they need keys to start the engine of the border, to get the border going? Maybe that's what those long lines at the port of entry are all about. When you're just sitting there in your tuba car, maybe Customs is up there in the kiosk going, oh, I don't believe this, I did it again. I, I forgot the keys at home. They tell you it's something mechanical because they don't want it to come on on the PA system. Senoras y senoras! We're going to be delayed here at the port of entry of the border. Uh, this, this is so embarrassing. I, I, I left the keys to the border in my apartment. They're in this big blue ashtray by the front door. I'm really sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll run back and get them. You see customs agents running all around the port of entry. You think they're servicing it, but no, the border, uh, they're actually looking for one of those magnet hide keys underneath, <laughs> underneath the border. OK, so that was the Jerry Seinfeld bit. But I... <laughs> Okay, um, and then uh, you know, I, um, I'm 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 trying to sort of move away from border simulator stuff, but it's really hard. Um, so uh, this is kind of just like a riff on on all kinds of stuff. I think this this poem mentions J.J. Arms, which I'll, I'm going to read like a prose piece of right after this. J.J. Arms is a real person from El Paso, Texas. He's a private detective um, who, as a child, had uh, an accident 
with uh, these, oh, I forgot what they were called, like uh, something like dynamite. I'll, I'll, I'll read a bit here in a moment. His, his hands were kind of mutilated when he was a child, so he has these hooks for hands. He's very famous. Uh, Marlon Brando hired him to find his kidnapped son uh, in the 70s. He was also uh, like a, a TV actor, and he had this giant mansion in El Paso, Texas, in a very poor neighborhood that my father lived right behind. So uh, I'll, it's more on J.J. Arms here in a bit, and he pops up in this poem. Okay. A distant mascot, Primitivo, is the coin of the realm. The mascot is far away because we're looking at him through the wrong end of a pair of binoculars because in our eyes, there isn't freedom from gazing or grazing. The ghost of freedom rides a bus to the realm of the border, and the ghost is the mascot of Primitivo. I'm not shoveling dirt on his grave because I'm not sure he's dead yet. The mascot leaves death, no, sorry, loves death more than life. Mascots keep going to heaven and then they return. Some mascots don't have a group. They are teamless mascots, but they're looking for work. There are two sides to the present and we all live at the border now. It's just that most mascots haven't realized it yet. According to surveys, mascots would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. We're watching Pulp Fiction, but it keeps cutting to another weird translation of the scene we're looking at. We're poking you with a stick, and now we're beating you with the stick. We are a bad translation of the great movie with a laugh track. There's Bushmills on the table, and the translation continues to be a bad version of itself, but somehow it's a better version of the original because it is the kiss that brings this robbery at Denny's together. The translation seems to be having more fun than its friends. This border mascot seems to be having more fun than its friends. The Southwest is so Southwest that it's the Southwest of the Southwest. <laughs> the, fence, the, 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 fence, the fence does not remember me, but the fuzz pedal does. The Southwest is a net and catches all the hungry crossers in it. We're hungry because the news rations our meals. Let the crossers cook, and thus, customs will eat. This crosser lacks zest. Let's make this crosser spicy. Through the snakeskin tapestry, I could see a mascot tied up in a chair. There's a green tint over my world. Primitivo, you may have noticed, has never met a stranger. Customs, you may have noticed, have never met a stranger. Primitivo eats his memories from a past crossing life. Digesting memories is never easy, it's hope casting. Give the reel more slack to reach a more profound depth. The desert fish are biting. Why is J.J. Arms also a distant mascot? He's far away in his giraffe mansion. He owns giraffes and white tigers, and I can see them through the mesh fence. Little squares. Can you identify which squares have a white tiger in them? What if the border could talk? It would say, we have multiple jailers, boys. I want my border to be read only. The border yells at a distant mascot, Primitivo, the coin of the realm. If the border could talk, it would say, some coins die, some come back to life. This is the wailing coin of the realm of the unlived. This is the wailing coin of the realm of the uninvited. And it's the crosser that was uninvited. They just appeared one day in 1991, the year of Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Milk sucked heaven in a vault of starry sway. Who knows he himself to worship proper sorrow? And a proper shower, now a simple field, finds improper sorrow. Scythed ripened seed and mascots corn parched ear, wet and wreathed. Wait till Hollywood mildews these scripts. The ashes pray, the bones pray, and the prayers pray. Even our prayers need prayers. This is the prayer of the Southwest. My cadences bring the mascots back to the entrance of our prayers. This prayer has an entrance. Please step into my cozy prayer. <laughs> okay, thanks. That was, that was very collaging. Uh, but uh, okay, so this next thing I'm going to read, 
I'm trying to write about JJ Arms, this private investigator from, from El Paso. Um, but it's really hard because his biography and his life is already too amazing. So literally what I've done is I've gone to his Wikipedia page and I just took my favorite sentences and sort of lineated them and maybe changed a few kind of words here and there. Um, so here we go. This is sort of like a found poem about J.J. Arms. And I'm hoping that maybe it can help me figure out how to write about J.J. Arms. Because I'm I'm, I'm, I've been trying and it's, his life is too big and, and amazing and strange to, to actually like capture in a way uh, I'm trying to figure it out. Okay, here we go. Arms was born Julian Armas to Mexican-American parents, Pedro and Beatriz, in Isleta, a low-income area near El Paso, Texas. At the age of 11, he and his friend Dick Caples broke into a Texas and Pacific Railroad section house and stole railway torpedoes. I'm not sure exactly what railroad torpedoes are, but arms rubbed two torpedo sticks together, detonating them and causing the mangling of both hands. Caples, who was standing nearby, was not injured. Arms was taken to Hotel Dieu, hospital in El Paso, where his hands were amputated two inches above both wrists. Arms went back to school four weeks after the surgery. Before he was fitted with prosthetics, he had a German Shepherd service dog named Butch. In school, he continued to play sports and learned to shoot a gun. Arms graduated Isleta High School at the age of 15. Arms earned his degrees in criminology and psychology from New York University through correspondence courses. So he was born Armas, right? And then he changed his name to J.J. Arms. Like, you can't make that up, right? He has hooks for hands. I mean, like, it's, it's pretty wild. Okay. Uh, uh, Arms earned his degree in criminology and psychology from New York University through correspondence courses. Arms had a contract to work with 20th Century Fox in Hollywood from 1949 to 1955. While Arms claims to have appeared in 39 movies and 28 television shows, the only ver verifiable appearance is one episode of Hawaii Five-O. <laughs> Arms played the villain in the Hawaii Five-O episode, Hookman, <laughs> September uh, 1973. The updated series Hawaii Five-O remade the episode with the same scenes and title on Je February 4th, 2013. In 1958, after briefly working as an actor in California and returning to El Paso, Arms started his private investigative agency called The Investigators. During his time as an investigator, he was involved in a kidnapping case involving the son of Marlon Brando. He collected around $25,000 plus expenses for that case. He was also allegedly involved in a jailbreak that later inspired the movie Breakout. In 1978, he, la he launched the Investigator's Security Course, designed as a mobile patrol and security service. This branch of the organization served the community for a number of years until the patrol division was discontinued. In 1976, Arms published his autobiography, J.J. Arms Investigator. In 1976, the Ideal Toy Corp also launched the J.J. Arms toy line, which featured a J.J. Arms action figure with detachable prosthetics, various gadgets, and a mobile investigation unit. In 1978, Arms and Ideal Toy Corp launched an investigative course for children which was introduced to a number of school districts throughout the United States. <laughs> the same year, Arms authored a comprehensive correspondence-based investigative training course and founded the Investigators Training Academy. In the 1960s, Arms had a small private zoo in his home in the North Loop area. That's where my dad was, was, uh, grew up. He raised German shepherds, big cats, and owned a chimpanzee. Later permits allowed him to keep the dogs and chimpanzee, own a cheetah, cougar, taper, and several monkeys. Arms learned to drive, fly a jet plane, and scuba dive. He and his wife, Linda Chu, had three children. In September 2020, Arms put his million-dollar El Paso estate up for sale. Okay, so that was, <laughs> that was my found J.J. Arms poem. And you can see why I'm having trouble writing about this like, larger-than-life person. I'm trying to figure, figure that out. Okay, and then I'm, I'm going to finish with one poem uh, from my book, The Border Simulator. And I'm going to try to read a poem that I don't often read. So give me one moment here. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This will do. Okay. Here we go. Um, this is called. Uh, and so, uh, uh, part of the book and part of kind of my obsession are are like B horror movies. Um, so that kind of like inflects and influences a little bit of, of this poem. Uh, through a designated lens, 
a death filter is an effect. I film the crosser through this window. I'm also a crosser in a slasher film that tracks back to the frame of the desert. I might hear sounds as the crossers hear them. Listen, is that a hand thrusting through the border fence? I'm under the table and the public knows it. Like a character exploring a sinister house, I see and hear no more than the crosser who should walk lightly the moment is full of cages. Customs has the ability to appear in dreams and attack the dreamer. A sorting algorithm of morality, no, mortality. To use the sorting algorithm of crosser mortality, add the screen score for each row, then divide by the number of crossers. Remember, this is a relative score, so you need at least three crossers from the same point of entry to establish a baseline. Eventually, there will be only one girl left standing. Primitiva, the final girl. Normally, the only morally pure member of the crossers. With considerable help from a holographic coyote, she will cross the border. It's a formula. What a formula. Uh, almost done here. Okay. The border can predict the future and predicts that I will hang clothes to dry on the border fence. I can't unsee the sister city, but wait. Yes, now it's possible. Customs put up a fence, and I can't see over it, only through its small mesh squares. If I use a light bulb with less wattage, will it soften my features? It's not clear, Juarez, but I can still hear the city. If I use a listening device to overhear a conversation, is the action legal? The border simulator pats me on the back and frames the crosser with a chiron that reads, the desert coffins cough themselves up from the ground. And now the coffins are traveling through the desert. Yes, a caravan of coffins is heading to the border. The caravan's motto was, cross now, cry later. But ever since customs threw tear gas at us, it's become cry now too. What they don't know is that crossers already extinguish their tears. We wouldn't have wasted a drop. All your friends spend hours pinching their phones, and all my friends are pinching themselves, trying to zoom in on themselves. Thank you, guys. So for a long time, uh, like I had like 10 years or so, where I just kept thinking about windows with panes. So like you would have windows in, with panes and the, the idea of each place you look through a pane is actually a poem. So I made a lot of poems that looked like this for a while. I actually, at some point, I badly printed things on like acetate and attached them to windows and things like that. But my window is your mesh. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And that was pleasurable for me. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you for being our November friends. We will not be back until January 29th, which is actually some sort of glitch yeah. in our schedule. Wait, no. It's, it's. It was on the thing as 29th. That is a lie. As you've probably figured out, I'm the face of this organization. <laughs> However, that doesn't mean I actually know anything ever. So, David, it says we are taking September off and the series will reset on January 29th. It will probably 19th is my guess. I would guess that it's the 19th. <laughs> yeah. So please join us again on the 19th. I'm sure all the people who are resting from are like visiting their families and all the grandchildren will be here. So it will be a much brighter audience. Um, there is a high possibility that our featured reader will be Joanna, uh, because I thought she was genius hysterical, and also I felt so much. Through. I have her book now because she trusted me to actually give her money, um, <laughs> which I was going to say wasn't wise. You should never trust anybody, but I'm totally going to send you money. So uh, you can trust me. Um, but yeah, I would really like to hear more of that because there's some things that are really, I really feel there. Um, I'm having a birthday party tomorrow. If you want to come, let me know and I'll give you my address. It's, um, we're like four blocks from here. It's 
we will have cake. Happy we will birthday. have. Yeah, happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah, I'm yeah. turning 60. Wow. We will have. That's why the last wave. We will have cake. We will have alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages. If it doesn't pour, we will have a fire. Um, I live in a modest house. I have many small dogs um, because I'm. Oh, I have cats too, but you won't see those. So, if that sounds like your idea of a good time, please come. Please let me know. I will tell you exactly where we are. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in January, and I love you. Thank you for all for doing the things you do.